Chapter 2, Section 4. But truly, transactions on the market are voluntary. <laughs> of course, it's usually maintained by so-called anarcho-capitalists that no one puts a gun to a worker's head to join a specific company. Yes, indeed, this is true. Workers can apply for any job they like, to an extent, but the point is that the vast majority cannot ha avoid having to sell their liberty to others. Self-employment and cooperatives are an option, but they account for less than 10% of the working population and are unlikely to spread due to the f a nature of capitalist market forces. Of course, as Bob Black pointed out, right libertarians argue that, quote, one can at least change jobs, but you can't avoid having a job. Just as under statism, one can at least change nationalities, but you can't avoid subjugation to one nation state or another. But freedom means more than the right to change masters. Bob Black, the libertarian as conservative. So why do workers agree to join a company? Because circumstances force them to. Circumstances created, we must note, by human actions and institutions, not some abstract fact of nature. And if the world that humans create by their activity is detrimental to what we should value most, individual liberty and individuality, then we should consider how to change that world for the better. Thus, circumstances, current objective reality, is a valid source of unfreedom and for human investigation and creative activity, regardless of the claims of the right libertarians. So let us look at the circumstances created by capitalism. Capitalism is marked by a class of dispossessed laborers who have nothing to sell but their labor. They're legally barred from access to the means of life, and so have little option but to partake in the labor market. As, Ale uh, as Alexander Berkman put it, the law says your employer does not sell anything from you because it is done with your consent. But you have agreed to work for your boss for certain pay, he to have all that you produce. Did you really consent? When the highwayman holds his gun to your head, you turn your valuables over to him. You consent, all right, but you do so because you cannot help yourself, because you are compelled or coerced by his gun. Are you not compelled or coerced to work for an employer? Your needs compel you just as the, Hawaii, the highwayman's gun does. You must live. You, cannot, uh, you can't work for yourself. The factories, machineries, and tools belong to the employee class, so you must hire yourself out to that class in order to work and live. Whatever you work at, whoever your employer is, it always comes to the same. You work for someone else. You can't help yourself. You are compelled. Due to this class monopoly over the means of life, the means of production, the means of existence, Workers usually are at a disadvantage in terms of bargaining power. There are more workers than jobs. This is normalized in the labor market for reasons. As was indicated, how does capital capitalism affect liberty? Well, within capitalism, there is no equality between owners and the dispossessed, and so property is a source of power. To claim that this power should be left alone or is fair is to the anarchists, preposterous. Once a state has been established and most of the country's capital privatized, the threat of physical force is no longer necessary to coerce workers into accepting these jobs, even with low pay and poor condition. To use Ayn Rand's term, initial force, has already taken place by those who now have capital against those who do not. In other words, if a thief died and willed his ill-gotten gain to his children, would the children have a right to the stolen property? Not legally. So if property is theft, to borrow Proudhon's quip, and the fruit of exploited labor is simple, a simply legal theft, then the only factor giving the children of a deceased capitalist a right to inherit the booty is the law, the state. As Bakunin wrote, ghosts should not rule and oppress this world, which only belongs to the living. Or, in other words, right libertarianism fails to meet the, char the charge that normal operations of the market systematically place an entire class of persons, wage earners, in circumstances that compel them to accept the terms and conditions of labor dictated by those who offer work.
While it is true that individuals are formally free to seek better jobs or withhold their labor in the hope of receiving higher wages, in the end, of their, in the end their position in the market works against them. They cannot live if they do not find employment. When circumstances regularly bestow a relative disadvantage on one class of persons in their dealings with another class, members of the disadvantaged class have little need of coercive measures to get what they want. See Newman, Liberalism at Wit's End, page 130. To ignore the circumstances which drive people to seek out the most beneficial exchange is to blind yourself to the power relationships inherent within capitalism, power relationships created by the unequal bargaining power of the parties involved. And to argue that consent ensures freedom is false. If you are consenting to be joining a dictatorial organization, you consent not to be free. And to paraphrase, paraphrase Rousseau, a person who renounces freedom renounces being human. Which is why circumstances are important. If someone truly wants to join an authoritarian organization, then so be it. It's their life. But if circumstances ensure their consent, then they are not free. The danger is, of course, that people become accustomed to authoritarian relationships and end up viewing them as forms of freedom. This can be seen from the state, which the vast majority support and consent to. And this also applies to wage labor, which many workers today accept as a necessary evil like the state. But as we'll be indicating in section 8.6, the first wave of workers viewed with horror as a form of wage slavery and did all that they could to avoid it. In such situations, all we can do is argue with them and convince them that certain forms of organization, such as the state and capitalist firms, are inherently evil, to use a more biblical term, and urge them to change society to ensure their extinction. So, Due to this lack of appreciation of circumstances and the fact that people have become accustomed to certain ways of life, so-called anarcho-capitalism actively supports structures that restrict freedom for the many. And how is this so-called anarcho-capitalism anarchist if it generates extensive amounts of hierarchy? It's for this reason that all anarchists support self-management within free association. That way we maximize freedom both inside and outside our organizations. But only stressing freedom outside organizations, so-called anarcho-capitalism ends up denying freedom as such. After all, we spend most of our waking hours at work. If these so-called anarcho-capitalists really desired freedom, then they would reject capitalism and become anarchists. Only in a libertarian socialist society would agreements to become a wage worker be truly voluntary as they would not be driven by circumstances to sell their liberty. This means that while right libertarianism appears to make choice an ideal, which sounds good, liberating, and positive in practice, it's become a dismal politics, a politics of choice where most of the choices are bad. And, well, frankly, to state the obvious... The choices we are free to make are shaped by the differences in wealth and power in society, as well as such things as isolation paradoxes and the laws and other human institutions that exist. If we ignore the context within which people make their choices, then we glorify abstract processes at the expense of real people. And as importantly, we must add that many of the choices we make under capitalism, shaped as they are by the circumstances within which they are made, such as employment contracts, result in our choice being narrowed to love it or leave it in an organization we create join as a result of these free choices. This ideological blind spot then allows the so-called anarcho-capitalists' definition of freedom as absence of coercion as workers freely consent to joining a specific workplace. Their freedom is then unrestricted. But to defend only freedom from in a capitalist society means to defend the power and authority of a few against the attempts of the many to claim their freedom and rights. To quote... Emma Goldman, 
rugged individualism has meant all the individualism for the masters, in whose name political tyranny and social oppression are defended and upheld as virtues, while every aspiration and an attempt of man to gain freedom is denounced as evil in the name of that same individualism. In other words, it's all fine and well saying, as right libertarians and so-called anarcho-capitalists do, that you aim to abolish force of, from human relationships. But if you support an economic system which creates hierarchy and so domination and oppression by its very workings, defensive force will be required to maintain and enforce that domination. Moreover, if one class has extensive power over another due to the systemic and normal workings of the market, any force used to defend that power is automatically defensive. Thus, to argue against the use of force and ignore the power relationships that exist within and shape a society and so also shape the individuals within it is to defend and justify capitalist and landlord domination and denounce any attempts to resist that domination as initiation of force. Anarchists, in contrast, oppose hierarchy and so domination within relationships, bar S&M personal relationships, which are a totally different thing altogether. They are truly voluntary, and they do not attempt to hide the power relationships involved by using economic jargon. This opposition, while also including opposition to the use of force against equals, for example, anarchists are opposed to forcing workers and peasants to join a self-managed commune or syndicate, also includes support for the attempts of those subject to domination to end it. For example, workers, uh, workers striking for union recognition are not initiating force. They're fighting for their freedom. In other words, apparently, voluntary agreements can and do limit freedom, and so the circumstances that drive people into them must be considered when uh, deciding whether any is such limitation is valid. By ignoring circumstances, so-called anarcho-capitalism ends up by failing to deliver what it promises, a society of free individuals, and instead presents us with a society of masters and servants. The question is, what do we feel moved to insist that people enjoy? Formal, abstract, bourgeois self-ownership freedom or a more substantive control over one's life, i.e. autonomy? 